Hello, everyone. Welcome to Stardog Demo Day. If you're here for our demo day on using a knowledge graph to better manage risk, you're in the right place. My name is Ingrid Ramos, and I'm a director of marketing here at Stardog. We run demo days, uh, try to do it as often as possible here every couple of weeks, uh, really to let you learn about our platform, about Knowledge Graph, and see under the hood, get into the product, and see what kind of business challenges Knowledge Graph can solve. Uh, today's demo is going to focus on risk, and we have with us today Greg Grubbs, who is the Senior Solutions Consultant here at Stardog. Uh, Greg has previously worked at organizations uh, around data warehousing, data engineering, machine learning. I really appreciate Greg's perspective uh, because he's technical and he's worked at a variety of organizations that achieve these goals in different ways, uh, including relational uh, databases, label property graphs. But we've got him here now uh, talking about knowledge graphs. So I think he's a great person to share some of the differentiators uh, across some of those ways to achieve. Uh, these goals. So with that, I'm going to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. A copy will be sent to you afterward. Please feel free to use the Q&A tool to ask questions. That helps us manage them best, but I am also monitoring the chat tool as well. Uh, we will try to get to the Q&A uh, likely after the demo, but if there's anything going on, just let me know uh, during the demo as well, and we'll get into that. All right, well, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Greg. All right, thank you, Ingrid. All right, so uh, what we're going to do today is uh, we're gonna give uh, a quick overview of Enterprise Knowledge Graph and uh, uh, show integration with uh, diverse data sources uh, because uh, one of the big uh, points is that you and uh, every organization probably has uh, a lot of different, uh, not just data sources, but data silos and things that you might not be able to change yourselves. And yet you need to get, uh, uh, you know, uh, deep insight from those data sources. Uh, what are the uses of, uh, of reasoning and inference in a graph? Uh, and then we'll get to demo and Q&A. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we have uh, a quick poll to do first. Is that right, Ingrid? Yes, I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that in a moment. There okay. you go. Just to get an idea of, uh, you know, where we're at with uh, in understanding knowledge graph. Looks like we're trending toward uh, folks that are somewhat familiar with Knowledge Graph uh, as being the most popular answer at 50%. Um, very familiar, 25%. Not very familiar, about 14%. Okay. And then less than 10% experts. Okay, fantastic. So I'll keep it open for a moment and then share the final results, but I think we can go on ahead. Okay, let's do that then. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, basically, um, a knowledge graph is something that is uh, a type of, in a sense, imposed over all of your existing data sources, uh, all or any subset thereof. Uh, and the purposes of it uh, existing are to decrease the time it takes to deliver data to to the citizen, what we call the citizen data uh, analysts that uh, that are empowered in your organization to uh, to make sense of all of these data sources and and how they fit together, and to make some uh, to to leverage value out of them. Uh, you need to unify data from multiple sources. So basically, uh, as is typical of data scientists and many other types of analysts. Uh, you need to make use of the data, but you don't have any ability to change, update, add uh, relationships, make it more clear, enforce data quality on your own. So that's another thing that Knowledge Graph uh, solves because it kind of, uh, it, it actually lets you create links where there are none in the data and find commonality between different data, uh, data silos. Uh, reducing the cost uh, for data scientists by focusing them on analysis, 
rather than that, uh, you know, that uh, pesky 80% of the time that you spend uh, doing uh, uh, cleansing of data and uh, kind of subsetting uh, for, for things on your own workstation. This allows you to actually uh, make the uh, highest use of the full sets of data that are actually in the organization. And of course, lowering the cost of integration work uh, by automating that rather than, as we'll see, one, one way to lower the cost is not requiring ETL into a brand new type of data, uh, a database uh, in the first place. All right. And uh, so ultimately, uh, that is uh, creating uh, these highlighted uh, benefits. Uh, complete data, lowest, lower cost, high quality, and an automated low-touch approach. All right. So the way it looks is graph itself is something that has relationships baked into the data. And I know that's always a, a, a question if, if you're new to graph databases that, well, I thought relational uh, databases deal with relations. Well, they do. They use the relational algebra to, uh, to uh, put things together. But the fact is your data in relational is out there with no relations between them. You know, it's just kind of uh, separate islands of tables that are only joined together when you do a SQL uh, query. Whereas in a graph databases, database, you have a, an ontology or a model over it, and the relationships are actually part of the data. And that will make more sense when, when, we, uh, when we look at uh, the demo. Uh, but the point is, Stardog, by the time the Stardog engine sees what your data looks like, it looks like it has always been in a graph format. But the fact is, it may be pulled into to Stardog if you wish it to, but, but for the most part, you'll probably be pointing to external data sources uh, out in your environment. Okay, so uh, we, we mentioned data silos just going left to right. Uh, you have the choice to pull it in for efficiency sake and maybe some other uh, local usage uh, reasons. Uh, or keep it out where it is in, in the external uh, sources in, in what we call then a virtual graph. And you will have one or more, any kind of combination of virtual graph and local graph uh, that you wish to have in your, uh, in your database. Uh, you have the ability because when the data is in a graph form, uh, certain patterns emerge from it. And it might indicate where sparse, sparse data is not uh, representing all of the relationships you have. Uh, so you have the ability, even though you can't go back and update the source, to enrich that data as, as you see it in the graph. And use the inference engine, which is another kind of superpower of, of, uh, of a RDF graph database, that to, to infer relationships where they don't actually exist in the data. We're going to definitely see that today in the demo. And then the whole other side of that data silo is that uh, the Stardog database itself can be made to look like a relational database to external tools such as Tableau and Power BI, uh, or your own UIs might use, uh, use uh, our REST APIs and things like that. Uh, which will become a little more clear. I always like to show this slide before I launch into a demo for all of you people who want to see a bit of an architecture and have an understanding of how the layers work. Uh, firstly, so this in this case, we're going uh, a bottom to top. Uh, you're, you may deploy on a, we, we offer a hosted cloud environment. Uh, you may have it in your own cloud environment, on-premise, uh, any combination of those is, is possible for the deployment. Your data sources, as we mentioned, will be many types of things. Uh, relational databases, uh, NoSQL, such as Apache Cassandra, uh, uh, Databricks Hive uh, notebooks, all of that. Uh, you might even be pointing to uh, JSON or uh, CSV files uh, as part of your uh, data sources that feed the knowledge graph. Uh, and then the compute 
area is basically where all of the Stardog platform resides. And it implements the inbuilt uh, machine learning algorithms uh, that are provided, the inference engine, data quality enforcement rules, uh, et cetera. And this kind of data quality is not is not the kind of typical um, batch oriented thing. The, 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 the inference rules and the data quality rules are actually implemented real time when you do a when you do a query within within this system. So that's something that's very different from uh, from what you're probably used to. Uh, certainly what you're used to in the you know data warehouse. And then uh, the only other thing that I want to add, to add uh, as kind of, uh, this is not you know an architecture session, but uh, that there is a layer above where you can have one or more models pointing to the same data. Uh, and because those models are different, you might, uh, you might, have them associated with different lines of business or different uh, user groups. So one particular line of business might be able to see uh, only certain data with no personally identifiable information uh, that's masked out or even just not available at all. Uh, whereas another group will see a full set and a much richer uh, total model. And those, those are called named graphs. And then each one of those name graphs can be separately uh, access controlled uh, based on you know, Active Directory or however you uh, identify groups of users coming in. So of course you've got uh, security on your uh, uh, original data sources in a relational world, but you also have this uh, additional ability to, to model uh, certain groups of users against certain types of views uh, via access control. And of course, uh, we'll be seeing Stardog specific tools like Explorer and Designer today, but you can also access the, uh, all of this data in the entire knowledge graph through whatever your preferred tools are, your own UIs, uh, BI tools, uh, Databricks notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, et cetera. So we have full REST APIs and, and uh, an extraordinary number of language bindings as well. So what we're gonna ask here is basically uh, the specific data set is an insurance, uh, would be used by an insurance company, uh, but there are, there are many types of data in it. So, the, the problem here that we have is that we want to write policies that are appropriate for the person, a combination of the person, what they own, what they owe, and uh, where they're located, actually, uh, if they're insuring property or vehicle. Uh, so the problem is we have incomplete information from multiple data sources that has never really been tied together. And we don't ourselves don't have control over the source data for enrichment. So the challenge is how then do we safely issue and price new policies taking risks into account? Uh, a, a simplified view of the data model that we, uh, we are looking at uh, will show some of the types, uh, it will kind of hint at some of the types of uh, data that we have. So we have uh, customers that we know of, uh, customers and prospective customers who own properties, who have uh, been paid out on insurance claims, who drive vehicles, drive and owe vehicle, owe taxes, et cetera. But in addition from other entirely different data sets, we'll have crime statistics for particular areas. Uh, we'll have, um, We'll know where fire stations, floodplains, uh, wildfire risks uh, exist related to uh, an address, and they're all completely separate sources. So, uh, so this will all tie it together. And then we want to be able to uh, estimate uh, quotes uh, for you know based on all of these uh, different things. And multiple personas will be able to use this knowledge graph to do their jobs. So that's uh, another aspect. 
All right. So going back to Stardog Cloud, I'm going to uh, launch Explorer, uh, which is going to connect to the uh, Stardog platform database server that I had previously uh, uh, selected. There are on this particular server very many databases. Uh, we're interested in just the insurance one. And the first thing I can do here uh, is to visualize what we had. So basically, this is already uh, just kind of a repetition of what we've seen before in terms of having the model here. But what Stardog Explorer does, it's meant for that citizen data explorer, is it also allows you to go straight into actual uh, instances, which means data. So now this is a, a address is a class in my model. Fire station is a class in the model. But this one thing I pulled out here is actual is an actual data point. So that's known as an instance of a class in here. And if I just send that uh, that out, then what I'm looking at is this address is owned by this person. And we could expand that person as well by, you know, basically that person drives a Ford uh, Montego and, uh, you know, had a claim at some point, uh, a claims report that was paid out uh, to that person. So uh, one thing we're not seeing, though, is O's. Remember in our model, we have O's taxes, but I don't see anything coming from this person that even has an O's relationship. Uh, so what's up with that? Well, the reason we're not seeing it is that that particular thing is in fact um, a, a link that is uh, created by, uh, by inference only. Uh, so I went to settings and I chose, let's turn reasoning on. By the way, reasoning and inference are synonyms. Uh, so the uh, parameter is called reasoning in, uh, in uh, our queries. And we now, well, this person actually does not owe taxes. So we're going to correct that uh, and, and solve that problem soon as well. Uh, one thing that you see is now we have, we have uh, multicolored uh, circles here. Why is that? It's because the inference engine has determined that this address is very closely related to assessments because tax assessments are made against uh, addresses and very closely related to uh, features, which are um, basically proximity to floodplains and uh, wildfire zones and things like that. Okay, but to really find out uh, the mystery that I was trying to solve, I'm going to turn reasoning off again just for fun. I can go to the query builder. Again, remember this is meant for the citizen data scientist uh, and citizen analyst who may not know the specific query language. So what I'm going to be interested in finding is customers who have a relationship called O's to taxes. So customer that owe taxes. When I run that query, I get uh, a set of results. Uh, and basically it's using the inference engine and, I, and uh, returns a lot of results. Uh, I see that some of these people owe more than one tax and I'm kind of interested in just randomly choosing one of them. So this Jonathan Han Hancock, uh, I'll look at that person and send, send Jonathan Hancock to the graph. And then we are going to see uh, that there are two taxes owed. Now, I don't know anything about these, but if I click and say expand by all relationships, and then maybe double click on this one also, okay, now I see a whole set of relationships. And what this tells me is that there is one tax owed against the vehicle and another tax owed against the property because there was an assessment for that amount on that property. But there was no direct 
tax owed link in any of the data that's purely uh, 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 an aspect of inference. And then let's see, one of the other things that we might want to look at is, and, and this, by the way, there's there's two things that we're looking at. These, uh, this vehicle seeing that there was uh, an assessment and a vehicle class relationship that the inference engine has figured out that it's kind of uh, both related uh, is one thing. It's just related by all of the types of links that connect uh, all the data, the inference engine de determined that these classes are in fact closely related. But this O's link is an explicit rule that someone wrote. And actually there are two rules. There's one called taxes owed for vehicle and another called taxes owed for property, each of which populates the O's link, uh, basically. So so those, those rules are very simple to, to write. Uh, in fact, they can be written in uh, Stardog Designer. Uh, and, uh, and, and basically will tie together uh, a lot of different types of things. We've got entirely different sets of data with different uh, users that I uh, mentioned before. There's one called... Uh, Well, let's just look at an address. Actually, let's let's look at a. I know there's a specific address that might be interesting. <laughs> so, uh, uh, actually, I'm looking for a customer that owns an address, and that address has a. Yeah, we can just look for a full address equal to uh, 1206. And notice that it's helping me uh, complete. I don't have case insensitive search on, so let's run that. And then uh, if we expand by all uh, links here, this person uh, we can see is interesting because they have both an inferred, uh, inferred links to taxes owed but also uh, inferred uh, inferences to uh, to uh, claims reports uh, that have that have been paid out. So this person has had uh, five uh, claims, and on their address, if we look uh, closer at the address, that's what I really let's just look at the address by itself. It expands to all kinds of things, uh, some of which are uh, links that are baked into the data. For instance, Bob Style is known to own this address, uh, but some of these other links were uh, built by inference, like it was built in an area of minimal flood hazard, right? So that's one thing you can see uh, that that is uh, the knowledge graph adds. And um, uh, some of these other things are, uh, again, like uh, part of the data, and some are like closest police station, uh, done by proximity searches uh, within areas uh, related to zip codes for uh, fire, uh, for floodplains, um, police departments, uh, fire districts, et cetera. All right. Uh, any questions uh, about any of this? And I have mentioned uh, the the inference rules. Uh, I can show uh, what those look like, but uh, basically, uh, the um, the bottom line is uh, again in one of the uh, in one of the UIs that we provide. Uh, it's called Stardog Studio, and that's a lower level thing that actually lets people uh, create queries that can feed uh, dashboards and uh, external UIs, uh, etc. 
So just quickly. I will show that. And I think this is, yeah, this is a, a query that shows the same information that we saw. But what we're interested uh, in doing is actually running uh, running quotes uh, against that. So basically, there are additional inference rules that uh, follow those taxes owed that followed uh, follow uh, hazard levels within specific uh, address places, and then we'll just with a with a simple query uh, create a, a predicted premium that we can. Uh, uh, that we can price a new policy on based on risk, uh, both of people and location. And again, this is not something that you would uh, be running necessarily or your users would be using, but they would be seeing the results of this query in a UI. And then the last thing is like, uh, if we have, if we have any specific interest in uh, in how Stardog is used from uh, from data science tools, because I know we have data scientists on the call, uh, I'd uh, I'd be happy to show that as well. Great. Uh, we do have a couple of questions on deck as well, so we're going to hit Great. those. Um, and some of this, uh, let's see. If I have tabular data with all the information you showed earlier and decided to train a deep neural net with it, how would a how would training a graph neural net on the knowledge graph data version give insights beyond those given by a regular deep neural net? Secondly, how are the predicates and nodes of a graph data set fed into a graph neural net? Um, so kind of a a double pronged question there. I don't know if that's yeah. too, too deep to go into right now. Um, so it's not. Uh, there is, uh, I'm going to pull up uh, because this is uh, uh, kind of more uh, conceptual than I can show with what I have right now. Uh, there is, uh, a section on our docs uh, called graph algorithms. Uh, there is there, there are basically three levels to this. One is the fact that data is structured in graph with relationships built in and the inference uh, engine available means that certain things just kind of naturally fall out of it. So, so Stardog built in has things like triangle count, in degree, out degree, as you would expect. Uh, we also implement uh, Valpal Rabbit uh, to, uh, or Wabbit rather, <laughs> to uh, to have certain uh, additional uh, closely closely tied in algorithms to the database, uh, such as page rank and so forth. Uh, but it's not that the deep neural net would be different in itself, because you would probably feed that to something running in Spark, for example. Uh, or TensorFlow, but what's different is the way you set you set the data in. Like, like you would not have to go through a step of changing that tabular data into a graph format for the graph algorithm to run. You can simply feed it a graph. Uh, in addition to the select uh, Sparkle statement, uh, for example, there's a construct statement which allows you to select to construct basically an on the fly graph uh, that is some subset or some specific shape uh, that is based on the data that's already in the graph. And you feed that uh, directly to the algorithm. Uh, or you do something like construct with an 80% training and another, uh, you know, 20% test or the vice versa, uh, and uh, and feed those in, into the algorithm directly rather than having it to have have to go through all that uh, CPU and mapping to uh, to uh, change it change the tabular data into graph data in order to run the algorithm. Uh, if that makes sense, there is uh, a reference here on this page. 
about using that uh, construct statement uh, and then just put that in a properties file and feed it to Spark, for example. Great. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and if you, uh, I, just to, to the person who asked if you have more questions um, um, to follow up on that, uh, we can circle back and get you connected with someone to answer that because um, your your organization is running um, start the Stardog platform in certain instances. So, um, okay. Yeah. So I know, Greg, that, uh, you know, making sure you didn't have anything else you wanted to show. We're going to wind down here a little bit if there's no further questions. I think you had maybe a final slide or two that you yes, want to go back to, um, maybe related to the outcomes of of mitigating the risk, you know, by incorporating that third party data and by showing the difference um, between having a reasoning tool and not having a reasoning tool, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and then if there's any other questions, it'll give everybody a minute or two, but we're definitely uh, winding down on time here. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so additional rules that uh, you know that are built into actually the pricing model uh, include crime statistics, which is a totally different uh, database, also uh, correlated with region and th therefore you know our prospective uh, client, uh, and uh, all of those uh, you know kind of were correlated into uh, the pricing. So basically, these are things that I cannot. I'm just not allowed to go and change the data silos or, you know, uh, uh, or update them in any way. Uh, and yet, even without that ability, I'm able to have inference, uh, not only tie those together, but uh, create easy to follow relationships uh, uh, for me to mitigate risk. Uh, and then uh, that enables the business without... Uh, Without taking too much of uh, you know IT uh, IT or the data warehouse people's time uh, to produce reports to to you know quickly uh, find and price that in. Great, thank you so much. It looks like uh, and then I guess the last question here was uh, importing an ontology that was created in Protege. Uh, which I think oh, also yeah. was addressed in our docs. Uh, yes, file. It, it, it certainly is. But, you know, just uh, the, the short and sweet of it is uh, basically uh, we'll read any kind of, uh, you know, W3C RDF format. Therefore, uh, in Protege, save as RDF XML uh, or Turtle for that matter, but uh, uh, whatever format you like. And then, uh, and then just uh, pull that into Stardog. It's like you can go into Stardog Studio actually and just uh, load it into the database. And then voila, you have your ontology. And, and once, as soon as you do, then you'll be able to see that and, uh, and uh, either continue to modify it or uh, simply map data to it uh, in Stardog Designer. Yes. And then just yeah. um, the to, there's another question, and then I just want to wrap up to okay. on the get into the product, uh, stardog.com, uh, get started there. You have the URL. Okay. Uh, also, just on our homepage, you can just click get started. There is a free version. Um, we recommend using it in the cloud. I know that we had some newbies on the call and some self-identified rookies. Um, and yes, um, th this actually comes with a knowledge kit, uh, what Greg has um has presented. So it'll walk you through sort of how to uh, open the knowledge kit. And so if you create a Stardog uh, account, you can go and do these steps mm -hmm. yourself. Um, right. You know, but someone did ask, like, what are the steps, you know, to create the ontology? Um, yes, I mean, you, there should be sort of a walkthrough in the cloud version. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can always either reply to my email when I send you the link to um, to the knowledge kit, uh, and or we can have someone sort of walk you through um, and how to do that if there's not the resources there. So, but in the interest of time, I just wanted to thank everyone. I know time is a precious commodity, and I always appreciate seeing everybody on these calls and getting all of your questions. And then, of course, to our speaker Greg Grubbs, thank you so much for spending some time and sharing this with us. My pleasure. And be expecting an email from me. And again, if you have any further questions, uh, just reply. That's me. Uh, if I don't answer, it's it's must have gotten stuck in spam because I'm pretty good about answering my my emails. So feel free to go ahead and ping me. 
and we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.